Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel lesson for this tenth Sunday after Trinity from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and cleanses the temple. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, peace begets permanence. That's true on any number of levels. It's true for individuals. When we as individuals are at peace, we endure. We remain whole and healthy and well. Same is true of groups of people, of societies. When they're at peace, within and without, they continue, they endure, they enjoy permanence. Same thing is true of the structures that individuals and societies erect. When there is peace, they endure. They are permanent. I, as an individual, am at peace with my environment. I don't have anybody out to get me that I'm aware of. I'm rather healthy. And so I experience a sensation of permanence. I feel like I'm here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. We, as a congregation, are at peace, you might say, and so we feel like we're here to stay. We enjoy a sensation of, of permanence. Our society, these United States, is at peace, more or less, within and without. We're not experiencing civil war. We're not engaged in fending off hostile invasions. And so we experience permanence as a society. And the same is true of our structures, the things that we build, our cultural artifacts. They will endure. They seem permanent. We count on the permanence of our infrastructure, our buildings, our networks, all of it. We expect we'll still be here tomorrow because it enjoys the permanence that comes with peace. The people of Jesus' day experienced what they thought was permanence because they had what they thought was peace, at least to a degree. <clears throat> they had an uneasy peace with Rome. They felt themselves to be under the thumb of a foreign dominion. But they maintained that peace, and through the peace that they had with Rome, they enjoyed permanence. That's one reason that Jesus' enemies were so desperate to get him out of the way. He threatened to rock the boat. They were scared that Jesus might disrupt their peace with Rome and bring the wrath of Caesar down upon them. They were scared that Jesus might bring about an end to their sensation of permanence. And if you were to enter Jerusalem with Jesus at the triumphal entry, you might get a very similar sense of permanence. At the time that Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was already a very ancient city. It had been there for quite a long time. Several centuries earlier, it had been destroyed by the Neo-Babylonians. But then the Persians had sent the Jews back to their homeland to rebuild their wall, rebuild their temple, rebuild their city. And ever since then, the city had continued. It had experienced conflict there had been great sufferings among the people of God, but the city itself remained. And the wall, the buildings, the temple, they were centuries old by the time Jesus entered. Now the temple was something of an exception to that. Yes, the structure itself was centuries old, but it had just been renovated a generation earlier by Herod the Great, who made it into truly one of the wonders of the ancient world. If you were to look at this temple, it would have struck you as the very embodiment of permanence. No force could ever sweep away this magnificent edifice. It was there to stay. I'm sure that everyone but Jesus was convinced on this day that the temple would endure to the end of the world. <clears throat> but Jesus knows better. Jesus knows that the permanence of the holy city depends upon her peace. Not peace with Rome, 
Not peace within her walls, not the avoidance of civil war, but the peace that counts, the peace that really matters, peace with God. As long as a city is at peace with God, it will endure everlastingly. But once that peace with God is disrupted, once God declares war on a people, on a place, once he pours out his wrath upon it, that permanence is dissolved. And that's what Jerusalem would experience. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem as he enters because he can see what no one else can. He can peer a generation into the future and see the consequences of Jerusalem's rejection of the Christ. They're going to betray Jesus in an effort to preserve earthly peace. They're going to denounce Jesus before Pilate, claiming we have no king but Caesar, and the king of the Jews would be crucified, rejected by his own people. Once he rose from the dead and the report went out that he was back, they would ignore the report, seek to stifle it, and finally attempt to silence the apostles of Jesus by violence. They would lay hands on the church of God, mistreat her for the next 40 years. <clears throat> but then, God's patience would finally run out. God would no longer be at peace with his people and with their city. He would stir up the armies of Rome against them. And the very authorities that the Jews used to secure the death of their Savior would be the authorities that would send their armies to destroy the holy city. <clears throat> and sure enough, just like Jesus foresaw, the Romans would surround the holy city. Their enemies would set up a barricade around her and hem her in on every side. And the Roman armies, under the guidance of God, would tear down the holy city to the ground, her and her children within her. They would not leave one stone upon another. The holy city, which seemed to be so permanent, would experience final dissolution. Why? Because she had lost her peace. As Jesus says, Would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace. But of course, they didn't. They did not receive Christ as their peace, as their source of permanence, as their only sure foundation. They did not know the time of their visitation, Jesus says, and so they forfeited their peace with God and with it their only hope of permanence. Now, those who heard Jesus, I don't think took him very seriously. Here you have the word of one prophet who claims that this is going to happen sometime in the future versus the manifest permanence of the walls in the temple. You look at these edifices, you think, what is this guy talking about? Surely we'll be safe. Surely we'll always be here. Surely we are permanent. And isn't it easy for us to have the same attitude? To look at the things around us and imagine that they are permanent. You can start with this building. It seems pretty firm. It's well built. It's lasted for decades, for nearly a century. Surely it can last for centuries more. Same is true of our homes, our infrastructure, Look at Washington, D.C. We have all these wondrous structures that reflect the permanence that we hope to find in our government, in our society. If someone claims it's all going to be swept away, we would reasonably enough dismiss him as a fanatic. But what if it's true? What if it's true that all of the structures we depend on, all of the things we take for granted as permanent, will be swept away? Jesus knew what he was talking about when he threatened destruction to Jerusalem. And he himself manifested this destruction in, in a small way by entering into the temple and destroying 
one of the human structures that dominated there. As you see, the temple was not only a magnificent building, it was also a corrupt institution that was run by wicked men who sought to fleece their people for all they were worth. The money changers in the temple sold the necessary sacrificial beasts at exorbitant costs and profited on the word of God far more than God intended. And if you were to ask an everyday pilgrim, an Israelite, can this ever be fixed? Will we ever root out the corruption in Jerusalem? The answer would probably be no. No, it's, it's just part of life here. There's no getting rid of it. I'm used to it. It's just going to continue that way forever. But then Jesus comes, and with His divine authority, He puts a stop to it. He drives out the money changers. He drives out those who sold. He says, it is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. What's really remarkable here is that Jesus converts it once more from a den of robbers into a house of prayer, and then until His death, He Himself is present in that temple preaching the Word of God and teaching His divine doctrine. Jesus already is beginning His work of dissolution, tearing down corrupt human structures and making way for what is truly permanent. What is truly permanent is prayer. What is truly permanent is the people of God, those who are at peace with God and who will therefore endure. So where does that leave us? We don't have any prophets, at least none that we can take seriously, who are prophesying an immediate dissolution of our country, our society, our church, our community, anything like that. And yet, we ought to recognize that this is the time of our visitation. Jesus is coming to you now through the proclamation of His Word, and He is presenting to you the things that make for peace the forgiveness of sins in His name, faith in the Son of God, and trust that through His life and death and resurrection on your behalf, you have everlasting life in His name. These are the things that make for peace. This is the day of your visitation. And if we reject it today, we will have no peace. We may have peace for a while, at least apparent peace and the permanence that comes with it, but if we're not at peace with God, if we don't recognize today is the day of visitation and receive Christ now, then the work of dissolution will continue. Maybe someday our country will dissolve. Maybe someday the structures around us will crumble. But what I can say for sure is we had better make sure that we as individuals are at peace with God because we ourselves are crumbling I experience the forced taste of that right now. I've got strife in my body. I've got some kind of invading infection that wants to do something else with my innards. And then I've got my uh, immune system that's working heroically to drive off the invaders. And I'm experiencing a certain sort of dissolution as we speak. I look forward to peace being restored and having once more that nice sense of permanence that comes with health and wellness. But this is just a foretaste of what's to come because all of us continue in a state of strife and consequent dissolution. And that's true even if we're Christians who are at peace with God. St. Paul warns us that the Spirit of God is at strife with our flesh and our flesh strives against the Spirit. We have conflict within us. And because of that ongoing conflict, our bodies will finally perish, just as surely as Jerusalem did. Because we don't have yet in this life the perfect peace that Jesus promises. And yet, there is a peace that does give us real permanence. After our bodies are destroyed, once they fall, once strife has overcome them and they are dissolved, we ourselves will still be at peace. We will still be reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. In our spirits, we will still have the forgiveness of our sins, unity with God, 
and peace in His presence. And because in our spirits, in our souls, we will be at perpetual peace with God, that means that in our souls, in our spirits, we will also enjoy permanence. We will outlast our bodies. They will go to their graves, but we will go on to experience peace in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what could lead St. Paul to say that his desire was to depart and be with the Lord. He looked forward to that peace that he would experience in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. That peace comes to us now. It comes to us in the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. And that peace will grant us permanence not only in our spirits when we depart this life, but also in our flesh. When on the last day God raises us from the dust of death, and grants us even in our bodies perfect peace and perfect permanence. When we are raised from the dead on the last day, we won't have any dissolution to look forward to. We won't have to worry about becoming decrepit, about falling prey to illness and strife. We will have perfect, enduring peace in the presence of God, and thus we will have permanence. We will endure before Him for all eternity. And that's true of the, the real Israel of God too. Yes, Jerusalem was destroyed. The structures were leveled. The corrupt human society was wiped away. And yet Jerusalem had a soul too, you might say. There was a church in Jerusalem, a congregation of believers and those believers, because they heeded the warning of Jesus Christ, were able to flee before the destruction came. And the spirit of Jerusalem, that church within her, endured and multiplied. And we today enjoy the fruits of her labors. We participate in the permanence of the Jerusalem church, which even as the city was destroyed by Rome, endured through the peace of God that she had in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God that you have peace with Him, that He has given you eyes to see and recognize the time of your visitation, that He has granted to you the things that make for peace, the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name, and the promise of life and salvation. May we receive the Christ with joy as He comes to us today, and through the peace that he has established between us and our God, may we enjoy enduring permanence in his kingdom, which shall have no end. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.